It is 2.30, so we're going to begin on time because I have certainly 40 minutes worth of content and I don't want to uh, steal anybody else's time. So um, thanks for coming. My name is Josh. I'm a co-founder, uh, head of product at Pantheon, and I've been around the Drupal project a long time, as my user number would suggest. Um, started a consultancy that did some um, really great work and continues to do great work called Chapter 3. But as you can tell from the branding on the slides and my t-shirt, I'm here to talk uh, in my Pantheon capacity. Um, Pantheon's always been associated with performance. Um, our original tagline when we got out of our private beta period was Zap! Instant Drupal! Um, and uh, the origins of a lot of what we built on the platform actually were in an open source initiative called Project Mercury that was an Amazon machine image with like memcache and varnish and you know, like tuned PHP and all the things that you wanted to make a Drupal website fast. Uh, so we've always cared quite a lot about this. Um, but we've also uh, cared quite a lot about the um, efficiency of development teams. Um, the performance side of uh, Pantheon, like I said, that's been a part of our history from the beginning. The dev team efficiency has also been uh, a part of the, the founding ethos of the company. Um, we didn't have a handed any project around it, but a lot of the know-how of how our workflow was built out of our experience as consultants and kind of implementing the same development practices over and over and over again to help our clients collaborate effectively with us as consultants to be able to deliver good projects so that you could run them on this big badass platform. Um, having the fastest hosting in the world doesn't help if you can't like coherently manage the work of several people to deploy that. I like to say that Pantheon has stamina. Uh, to use a term from the election or from pop music, um, we've got stamina. Uh, and that's one of the great things about um, using a large platform is that um, you can't crash it, really. Um, it's not something you're going to be able to tip over. Um, it's a very big, uh, uh, safe thing. In the ocean of the internet, we are a big ship that can weather a storm. Um, we use a different technology, containers, and I'm borrowing the metaphor from the container shipping line here. Um, but it's actually quite apt because one of the things that containerization did to shipping was it allowed you to move vastly more stuff from point A to point B with fewer people. Um, and so here's an example of one of the largest container ships in the world, and it can transport, you know, 1,500 containers and has a crew of 13 um, because there's so much automation uh, built into how the whole thing operates. And that's key to how we are actually able to do everything that we can do because we operate much more efficiently than a traditional hosting um, company would from a technology standpoint and, and also in terms of how our business is structured. We're able to ship a lot more Drupal, so to speak, with far fewer crew. And that makes us much more efficient. It's what allows us to make Pantheon free for development purposes. And it it's what allows us to offer you as many development environments as you want um, spin them up on demand and not have to pay for them. That's not like us lighting VC money on fire to like offer some unsustainable market grab thing. That's actually a sustainable business proposition because we've built a much more efficient company. The downside of building a different type of technology to be much more efficient is that there's some very much unfamiliar stuff uh, with the Pantheon platform. Um, you know, in particular, people who are used to building on a single VM, um, Distributed systems are different. Um, they're harder to keep track of. Uh, it can be much more difficult to understand what's going on. Um, you're used to be able to getting, getting into the box and just like figuring it out, not possible to do on Pantheon in the conventional ways. And this can create a lot of angst, um, a lot of uh, uh, resistance, a lot of fear, a lot of frustration. Um, and in the worst of all possible worlds, we can end up with this like terrible finger pointing exercise where a website that like works great on some development machine or worked s great someplace else gets moved to the platform and doesn't work so great. And the question is why? Whose fault is it? Is it your fault? Is it your fault? And you know, this is really a, a position that nobody wants to be in. Um, nobody wants to be on like the uncomfortable phone call with the client and the platform provider and everyone's not trying to like come out and say it but everyone's thinking it was fine or our stuff was good right this is just bad all around bad for everybody um, but it's not uncommon and it's actually not a unique problem to us I think like everybody who's worked with various different platform providers infrastructure providers hosting providers over the years you're familiar with this dance where the platform provider or the infrastructure provider is kind of a see no evil, speak no evil, evil, hear no evil. They're like, well, I can tell you what I know. I can tell you what I can see. If what I can see, the box is totally up. And you're like, but the website's totally down. But like, but the box is totally up. But the website's totally down. And you're just talking past each other and not having a good experience. Um, it's a problem in our industry, to be honest. Um, and I think that it's an ongoing problem in the industry because there's essentially 
you know, things have progressed forward, but there's a gap in what's being offered. And if you'll permit me, I'm going to get to the technical stuff in a second, but a little light market analysis. Uh, if you look at the ways that you can run websites that are out there, on the one hand, you have people who are, um, you know, without apologies, infrastructure as a service providers, like Amazon EC2. There is no support, right? You can actually, if you're a super enterprise customer, you can get some kind of support, but it's not what you would normally think of. Like, they want to deliver their stuff as a commodity with an API, and you're on your own. You're on your own for your website security, you're on your own for your uptime, you're on your own for everything because basically they have a cloud that works and you in interact with it via an API and if you can't make your application work under those constraints, that's your problem, not their problem. And, they're, they're, and, and if you can live with that kind of trade-off and you can embrace that kind of responsibility, you can have a lot of success that way. And then you have traditional hosting, which is a dying industry, but still a very big one that's out there. Um, Rackspace was the kind of the, the banner carrier for this. They, they like to say they were the original great hosting company, and, and now they're pivoting to offer support for Amazon EC2 because that's where the market is moving. But they're, you know, it's this traditional hosting model, which is about um, guaranteeing what a hosting provider can guarantee, which is like power, pipe, and bandwidth, and all that other stuff. And they can say, um, yeah, it looks like something's not working. Do you want me to reboot the box for you? Right, that is essentially as far as their support can go. Like even if they offer like at their highest level of service, they'll make sure that Linux is updated. But that's just the kernel, right? They're not gonna be able to tell you what's wrong with Drupal, what's wrong with your database, why things are slow, why things are down. Um, and then there's a gap which we'll talk about. You go all the way to the other far end of the spectrum where there are people who provide a lot of value as kind of managed CMS providers. Um, buzzword like one throat to choke. Um, and there are people in the Drupal ecosystem that do this, uh, that, are, uh, that are quite successful at it. I think a good example, though, that I've uh, learned about in the past couple of years is from the WordPress ecosystem. WordPress VIP is kind of the ultimate gold standard uh, WordPress platform. And uh, it's such a gold standard that they actually have human beings review your code before you can deploy it, and they will reject your code. They will say, nope, not going onto our platform. Um, or, or you need to do this differently, or we don't allow this sort of thing here. Um, and the, the upside is that you know, the, for a website owner, you're getting guaranteed that all the code that gets deployed is, is got a seal of approval and has been checked. The downside is that code review can take weeks, and if, the, if code review comes back negative, it takes an undetermined amount of time to figure out what you, how to get done, what you were trying to get done. So it, it ensures, in a very effective way, the stability of the application, but at a heavy cost for velocity uh, for your developers. And if you're trying to run an agile process where you want to release code often, release changes often, it, it's basically a deal breaker. Um, there are other service providers who will offer to do updates for you, right? White glove support. And they'll make sure that all your modules and core are up to date, which is great if you don't have your own development team, but if you do, it can create this very difficult and ambiguous situation where it's unclear who's doing what update when and where, and you can get right back into that terrible finger pointing place where something went wrong and nobody's sure who made the change. So the point is that there's this big gap in the middle. Like, shouldn't there be something better than this where you can actually like get good support from a platform provider without stepping on each other's toes or without having somebody be this big blocker for stuff? And as we're fond of saying at Pantheon, there's a better way to do this. We have a clever little video and a series of videos about how there's a better way to do this, um, and there is. And what we have started to do this year, uh, as of June 26th, is provide New Relic application performance monitoring at the pro service level for all sites on the platform, regardless of whether they're paying or not, in all environments. So we basically um, bought a platform-wide license for New Relic Pro and provide it to everyone who opts into using it on the platform. And we've actually worked with New Relic for a long time. We've used, um, we, we've thrown some great parties. Like when they were really going through their big growth curve, they were just like throwing sponsorship money around, which was awesome because like they, this we had this awesome party at DrupalCon Austin that was like 80% their money. Um, it was amazing. Um, but we've also had, oh, sorry, we've had their uh, light version of their product on the platform since we first got started. And a lot of other uh, platform providers or infrastructure providers will offer New Relic Lite. Um, and New Relic Lite has a lot of value. It's kind of like a high-level dashboard. It gives you kind of the EKG output of your website. Like, how's it doing? Is it up? Is it down? How fast is it? Is it slow in the database? Is it slow in the application? But their Lite product, because it's free, is meant to be a teaser to get you to buy their real product. 
um, the light product doesn't provide you any diagnostic capabilities. It doesn't really tell you, it tells you if something is wrong, but cannot help you figure out what is wrong or why. And uh, versus the pro product, which is what they try to upsell everybody to, which is like x-ray vision for your website. It actually lets you see inside what's going on and uh, diagnose where performance problems are coming from, help you solve them, help you verify that they're solved, and basically win at life in running uh, high performance websites. Um, this is how it works. So um, every PHP process we run on our platform inside its container also runs with the New Relic extension bundled in. That talks to a collector daemon, which also runs on our platform that aggregates the data. And then that gets sent out to New Relic's data cloud. Um, and the, uh, the information I'll be presenting in this presentation is all based on aggregate data that I've been able to extract from said New Relic cloud. This is what it looks like. Um, this is the dashboard. It's kind of the same whether you're paying for it or not. Um, it's just this is the high level overview of like how things are doing, like what's my throughput like, how is my performance going, et cetera. And there's some, some light visibility into like Drupal modules, Drupal hooks, even views can be broken down from a performance standpoint. Um, it's measuring application execution. So we had this um, slide before showing our platform and there's kind of like we want to make, make a little bit of a separation. We're not measuring anonymous page views for the most part with uh, New Relic because frankly, when you have a, a reverse proxy implemented properly, which is, you either do or you don't, it's like zero to one or on off. If it's working, then your limiting factor is the speed of light and your network connection. And if it's not working, it's not worth talking about anything until you get it working, which is not, New Relic is gonna help you with that. Um, so whether you're using Varnish or you're using Nginx or whatever else, a good reverse proxy makes anonymous page views as fast as they can possibly be on the internet. The next step for performance optimization there is to work on your front end to make it render faster, but you're not gonna deliver something faster than a reverse proxy would. But what if the page isn't in cache? Right, either it hasn't been cached yet or it's not a cacheable page because the user's logged in or they have a shopping cart or they have some kind of cookie that you're personalizing their content based on or they're, they've hit a very specific URL with some search queries or they, they filled out a form so it's a post request. Basically, when you can't cache the page, you have to run your application engine. And that's what New Relic instruments and measures. It measures things inside PHP and then it can measure all the things that PHP has to talk to to deliver a page request. And that is where the difficult and interesting problems are in making websites fast. So basically any page that you get a transaction trace on, which basically is any page that doesn't meet your performance criteria that you've set in New Relic, you give it a threshold basically, and if it's above this threshold, it'll give you a complete functional stack trace of every PHP function that time was spent in in a whole waterfall essentially of how the code executed. So you can just step through it bit, bit by bit and it'll, you know, it'll mark things in red when they stand out. So it can kind of help you find the right places where there's maybe to draw your eye to first. But this level of visibility um, is crucial in being able to diagnose what's going on with your performance. It does the same thing for slow queries. You have slow database queries. It'll log those for you, give you easy access to them through the dashboard, give you the breakdown of why they're slow. It also keeps track of external service calls. So like if you're calling out to an API or you're talking to Apache Solar or something like that, it'll keep track of those, let you know how long they're taking, how often they're happening, etc. cetera. Um, and then it gives you the breakdown. It can give you this breakdown by module. There's a little bit of Drupal instrumentation inside. And there's actually PHP functions that let you add your own. If you have specific things that you want to track for your application, you can actually augment New Relic's awareness by sending markers and so forth so that you can profile your performance in your own terms. So basically, it lets you see inside the monster that you've created um, and, uh, and understand very quickly what's going on. It's like literally days and weeks can be saved by doing this. So let's get to the data already. Um, the methodology that I used was to look at about uh, 2,000 sites. This is um, sites that have opted in to use New Relic on Pantheon. We don't turn it on by default because it is sending your data to a third party. We want people to to turn it on knowingly and know that it's there. Um, and I also uh, selected four sites that are live, that have production website, production domains on them, and got a certain minimum threshold of traffic. So for instance, my personal blog, which gets only a few hundred visits a week, which are all anonymous, did not make the cut for this survey. But about 2,000 other sites did. Um, we are measuring across about 3 million different uh, transactions, so that's a unique page request. Um, we use uh, a midday, one hour uh, data sample, so that's like, you know, pretty much in aggregate peak performance, or sorry, peak throughput, so business hours, 
on a Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, so uh, you're still hitting, you know, whether your audience is in the US or, or Western Europe, you're probably getting a good amount of uh, 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 real uh, um, traffic. Uh, we captured the total throughput and response time, the SQL query count and response time, the external call count and response time, and then we specifically looked at views because, again, that's a, a super popular module with a lot of concerns surrounding it, and I wanted to look specifically into how views was performing at this just scale of data. Uh, quick caveats. Um, I put this slide in performance talks often, uh, speaking from the platform side where I get to sort of look under the hood at a lot of stuff. Um, the goal here is absolutely not to performance shame anyone. Um, the realities of websites are that you have uh, scope, budget, deadlines, and uh, changes. And managing all of those to reach a launch and continue to maintain a website over time involves compromise. I don't know of any website that ever launched that didn't at some point have things in it that people weren't 100% proud of um, or didn't feel great about. And the, the, the purpose of this talk is, is not to point any fingers or call anyone out on that. It's simply to talk about things that we can observe so that we can learn, so that we can do better in the future. So whether, whether we do look at specific cases, we've anonymized the data. The aggregate data is obviously anonymous, but we're not going to talk about any one of the particular websites that I'll point out. Um, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. It's just the facts. Um, so let's start. So on average, I, uh, my first cut on this was like, it's pretty good, actually. So um, looking at a histogram of average response times, uh, there's, you know, it looks pretty good. Overall, the average response time for dynamic requests for Drupal sites that run on Pantheon, um, a lot of them are hitting in the under one second time frame. Um, which is about, I think that's kind of a, 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 a reachable bar for websites that aspire to be high performance. Ideally, you want to be all rendered for the user in one second, but that can be hard to do. If you're responding in one second, what you're giving, giving a user on the other end of the screen is that the, within one second, they see that something is happening. They're less likely to navigate away. They're less likely to, to get upset. We'll do questions at the end, if you don't mind. Um, but there's a, in this red, there's a significant um, minority population that's out there. And I had to cut this off because in the long tail of slow responses, there's like a long, long, long tail. And as you'll see in another graph, some of these sites are like just incredibly slow. But uh, in, in overall, there's a good chunk of sites that are having um, fast average responses. Um, however, if we don't look at the average response, but rather look at the, the 99th percentile of slowest response, um, there are a lot of sites that have some slow responses. Um, slow responses in the two, three, four, five second range, which, you know, maybe that's on the, that's, you know, if it's an admin page and someone's logged in and they know they're supposed to be using the site professionally, that's probably okay. Maybe something that could be improved, but that might just be how it is. But we had a large chunk, and again, I had to cut off the, the percentile range at the 80% range. So 20% of the sites that we sampled had a, had a slowest response that was over 13.3 seconds, which is a really long time to wait for a website to return a result. Um, and, uh, and so clearly there are uh, opportunities for things to be improved, things to be optimized. Um, so maybe this was just like the one query gone wrong, or you know, maybe this is we happened, happened to capture someone who is like submitting a change on admin build modules, which blasts out all the caches, and requires a lot of stuff to be rebuilt, but it's still um, a signal that maybe there's work for us to do and things for us to look into. Um, another thing we can look at from the high level data is that um, average response time and total throughput correlate. And what that means, what I mean by that is sites that do more traffic have faster responses, which makes sense when you think about it. Higher traffic sites are more likely to be sites that are monetizing their traffic or are driving some critical business process off the traffic. And so uh, they are the sites where the teams can invest in performance and where investing in performance makes sense. So um, while there are clearly some sites out in the long tail that are, that are performant, once you start to get up into the head, the red line there is total throughput, um, and it's a power law, unsurprisingly. In the one hour sample that we looked at, um, the number one site was doing 150,000 dynamic requests in that hour. That's a sustained throughput of 60 dynamic requests a second, which is a lot. It means like not just that's not counting anonymous traffic. That's pages that had to be generated from scratch 60 a second. Now, actually, it was a little bit up and down, but as a, as a sustained throughput over an hour is, is a lot. Um, but they have very fast response times, so it's all good. 
Um, and, uh, and you'll notice that up in the sort of the, the head of that, the average response time, which is on the left, that first bar is the one second line. Almost everybody's under that one second line. Um, and that's because they've, they've really thought about optimizing for performance. Uh, when we look into why things aren't fast, unsurprisingly, um, I.O. is the big pain point. Um, this has generally been true uh, since the dawn of time and will probably continue to be true for the foreseeable future. Um, the big challenge here is that PHP um, doesn't do uh, asynchronous I.O. Uh, out of the box. So whenever you have your Drupal code running and it has to ask a question of another system, whether that's running a database query, uh, making an external API call, talking to Redis or Memcache, or um, even writing or reading from the file system, everything stops until it has that answer. It will not do any other computation. It will hang. It won't even let the CPU uh, core that it's using do anything else in the meantime. It's like, nope, it's mine and I'm waiting. And so you get this IO wait uh, in your system. And this is an example of a particular site, um, application ID 5113593, will remain nameless, um, did 4,600 dynamic requests in the sample time. Um, average response was two and a half seconds. That's not awesome, but it's not the worst. Um, max response was almost f f six, six, seven minutes, which is kind of crazy. So maybe that was like a cron run or something else. Um, and you look at what they, what they were doing with that. Um, they have external calls, like an average of one and a half external calls per page view. So they're doing some kind of external call out all, every time, at least once. Um, with an average response time of 300 milliseconds, which is pretty good, but a max response time of five seconds, which is kind of slow. Although I will point out that they're doing something correct here with, you see this is 500.000. This means that they were, they were smart enough to set a timeout. Um, basically, if the external service doesn't respond within five minutes, they, stop, they cut it off and they don't care. And that's actually really important to do, as we'll see, because if you just make an unbounded commitment to an external service, if that external service is down, or slow, so is your website, um, which is a pretty bad thing to realize is actually happening. Um, the other thing with this site that we'll see is just a really high um, number of queries and really high number of Redis uh, calls. So two and a half million uh, calls out to either the database or to Redis to deliver all these page requests. And um, the average response time is one millisecond, which is what we would hope to see. But the problem is that it's never gonna get less than one millisecond. Whenever you make a call out to one of these external services, there's a minimum amount of time to go round trip and make that, ask that question and get that answer. And so if you ask a lot of questions, even if the responses come in as fast as they could possibly be expected to, uh, to come, there will be a penalty you'll pay for performance for asking all those questions. Um, looking at views, since we're talking about IO, I'd like to put out that it's clear from the data that views is not a kiss of death. Um, there's a lot of uh, FUD I've uh, heard over the years where people say like, oh, you can't use views. Um, you know, views will kill your site. Um, and, and we'll see a couple uh, in the next slide, that views can kill your site, but views doesn't necessarily kill your site. And, and what we see here again is um, we're graphing in blue the number of views calls made during the sample time and in red the slowest view. So the, the number one uh, uh, user of views on Pantheon during this time made 1.2 million views calls during that one hour, uh, one hour time frame. But their slowest view was, you know, that last red bar at the edge is really low. So they, they don't allow slow views to happen. And, uh, and it, as you'll see in the next slide, actually a lot of these views are cached. So this is like, um, I looked into it, it's like a news site. It's a news site with a political bent. Um, they must have been a busy news cycle during the hour that I was sampling. Um, but like, you know, uh, 1.2 million views in, in an hour and the site was just fine. Right, so views, if used properly, if implemented correctly and cautiously, um, is certainly scalable and high performance. Um, if we actually plot out the average view response time versus the slowest view, we get some interesting uh, findings. One is that over here in the bottom left, in the green box, you see like a lot of sites that are using views responsibly. Their average view response time is like under a tenth of a second, probably because the view is cached. 
So that's good. Um, and their slowest view is still only coming in a few seconds. And like you don't really want something to take four or five seconds to generate a view, but if it's part of a caching strategy where you know that you would generate that once and then you cache it and the next 10,000 times it's served out over the next hour, it's only taking you know, a tenth of a second or less, you can decide that that's an acceptable trade-off as a developer and go forward. Um, where you don't want to be is with this one site that's up there with a red, uh, red box around it where their average view time is, uh, is 0.2 seconds and their slowest view is taking like 35 seconds. Um, so like that's a, you know, 35 seconds is too long. Um, the, the user's not even, they're gone. They're not going to wait for that to happen. They've browsed away and started to like look at Twitter or something. Um, and if your average view is taking, um, you know, uh, two tenths of a second, you're not caching your views. Um, and so that, you know, there's, there's uh, unless you have a very specific use case that says you can't cache anything and people will wait forever for their data, this is just a, a bad position to be in. And again, this was actually a different uh, uh, news oriented site that had a large long tail of content and there's just like some really, the good news for them is that there's low hanging fruit. Like there's stuff that they can just do to optimize their performance that will make their website faster and make their users happier. Um, so it's all, it's not that views are good or bad, it's how they're implemented. And again, the thing that we do find that correlates with slow response times is a quantity of queries. So the blue line here is the average response time. So higher is worse. And the red bars are the queries necessary to generate each page. Um, there's only a couple of cases where, and we're, they're on the same axis in this one, which is nice. There's only a couple of cases where the number of queries uh, to generate the page on average exceeds the average page response time. And that's probably because of some weird use case where they're running like tons and tons of queries over here and just a few elsewhere that it, it sort of skews their average response time. In general, the number of queries you run, for pay, uh, you run per page are like, directly correlated with the response time that you'll be able to deliver on an, on a, on an ongoing basis to your customers. And these, these sites that ha are where the response time starts to creep up and up and up, you can see they're running more and more and more queries. It's just an inescapable law of physics, basically. Thermodynamics says data has mass. If you want to move data, that takes time. Um, so sometimes we see queries that could be optimized. So again, here's a case where um, uh, a query generated with a subquery um, that was being uh, passed in, uh, it's trying to match a, a set of node IDs. And this is a common pattern that we'll see where um, code that was built with a small data set in mind doesn't necessarily scale so well as the data set grows. And so in this case, um, you know, it wasn't just that there was a lot of queries, that this was a particularly slow query. And again, one of the benefits of the tools here is that we can very quickly drill in and see what qu query is slow. And in this case, the number of, it, I have to cut it off because it's a screenshot, the number of NIDs being passed into this query was like 2,500. And so it's just like never going to be an efficient query because it's, it's you know, it, gen it was originally probably thought of as being like, oh, it should have like five or 10, but now it's like 2,500 and it's taking, you know, 400 milliseconds to process that every time and, uh, and just not working very effectively. Uh, being able to find the slow queries and knock them out quickly is very important. Um, external API calls. Similarly, blocking I.O. Your website will stop until it receives a response from whatever it's talking to. So here we see some interesting uh, groupings when we plot the average duration, uh, ver sorry, the average duration horizontally versus the average quantity um, vertically. And sort of three groups here. There's the green group, which is people who are generally doing things okay. Like they have one or two per page and they're coming back in you know, less than a couple seconds um, and a lot of them coming in much quicker. Uh, the light blue group is interesting because these are websites that actually appear to rely on a lot of external API calls. They have, you know, uh, five, in some cases, even almost 10 per page. That's a lot of API calls we're making per page. You'll notice that none of them take all that long. Like, if you're going to build a website that makes that many external API calls, they better be fast, or you better have a low timeout, because otherwise you're just setting yourself up for a recipe for your users to be frustrated and pages not to be rendered. People in the red are people who need to think about um, setting or, or reducing their threshold for their timeouts, because their average API call is, you know, this isn't the slowest, this is the average. Their average API call is taking, like, you know, five to seven and a half seconds. Um, and that's a point at which, like, you know, Everything else still has to happen before the user can see the page. Probably an unhappy user, probably not coming back to your website. So think about um, optimizing how that um, gets delivered. Uh, here's a specific example um, where we were diving in to help a customer um, deal with uh, external 
uh, well, deal with a website that appeared to be down, um, and we found the problem was in an external API call. Um, it's a bit hard to read. It's small, so I'll, I'll uh, call it out for you. Nine calls to this external API, taking a total of 219 seconds. So no user is waiting for this to happen. They're long gone, but the, the, the uh, code runs on even when, if a user closes their browser tab. And this is how you end up with a down website uh, due to external API calls. When you don't have a timeout set, you're basically uh, making your uptime dependent on any third party provider's uptime. Because what happens is, um, even on a highly scalable platform, there's a finite number of PHP uh, threads you're able to run at a, at a specific time. You can kind of allocate more, but at a, there's a boundary for sanity's sake, as, as you'll see. What happens to this website is a page request comes in from a user, and Drupal begins to execute, and it makes this external API call. Um, it's going to make nine of them, in fact, and they'll take 200 seconds, you know, two, two and a half minutes, to, uh, to, or three and a half minutes to come back around. Um, during that time, another request will come in, and the next PHP thread will be initialized, and it will begin making these external API calls. And again, and again, and again, and again, until all your PHP worker threads are basically just waiting on this external API, and eventually your users will start to see, we, we, we do this, we start to fail fast so that people like, aren't waiting around forever. It's just like, hey, we can't seem to get a response from this website. And it's because the website has basically blocked all of its time off to wait for some other website to tell it a piece of data. So if you care about your site's uptime, let alone its performance, you must have timeouts on any external API call you make. It's just insane to operate otherwise. Um, and internally, we see some of the same things, actually, with uh, some of our own services. So like uh, Redis, uh, which we implement instead of Memcache, but they're equivalent services for the most part, um, as an object cache. Uh, can actually suffer uh, from the same I.O. problems when sites have a large amount of data in cache and they get a really huge spike in dynamic traffic, possibly from a denial of service attack, possibly from some super aggressive spidering. Um, in this case, the, the client that we're showing this from, they had disgruntled customers who were, it wasn't really a denial of service attack, it wasn't like a bot army of webcams, it was just like a lot of disgruntled customers, but they were purposefully running scripts to try to like hammer this website. So a few hundred people doing that was able to generate thousands of times the normal amount of dynamic traffic. Their average page load required pulling with uh, a big variables table and all the views, object caches, and a few other things, required pulling something like 50 to 60 megabytes of data out of Redis into Drupal to be able to render the dynamic page that would then be sent out. And once the traffic for dynamic pages spiked up, the number of calls into Redis to pull out 60 megabytes of data spiked up as well, and the limiting factor became the network connection to Redis. And so we started to see these sl slow connections to Redis. And like normally when you're talking to a key value store, you would never see a GET request taking you know, hundreds, let alone thousands of milliseconds. But we saw that it was due to network contention. So again, IO, even when it's not talking to a slow disk or a slow external service, can still be a bottleneck. Um, and so we try to minimize it wherever possible. Um, finally, um, it's not just about IO. Um, I have a, a, a sort of a war story to tell of a site that was, um, they were running a, um, uh, their Drupal site was just a REST API, right? They had a, a front end that was, that was decoupled, and they were just looking to get some JSON out of Drupal. And they're like, this JSON endpoint takes 30, 40, 50 seconds to respond. What's up? This is totally broken. And we looked, and we're like, oh, this is bizarre, right? There's no significant database activity. Um, there were no external API calls being made. They weren't using a, a resource that was being bottlenecked. And so we had to like actually dig in and start to do some instrumentation. We went to the full stack trace, and um, we uh, what we saw was lots of calls to and from the form cache, and then. Um, being able to dig a little bit further into that, we saw that there was uh, the endpoint to generate the JSON they wanted was loading 1,500 nodes, and then because of the way that they wanted to get a piece of data out of it was actually invoking the process to build the edit form for every one of those nodes to get one bit of data and then insert that into the response and the callback. And so uh, it was something where, you know, Drupal's normal response, it's usually you're editing or adding one node at a time, and that's like, you know, expensive, but it works fine. But you multiply that times 1,500, and it doesn't work so well. Sorry for anybody who was getting seasick from watching the recursion. Um, so looking forward, what are things that we want to do, uh, and what are the things that we know? Well, spoiler alert, PHP 7 is a definite win. We've measured this across the platform in a number of cases, and um, 
if you can update, most sites can update to PHP 7 without any changes or with the, the most modest changes necessary. And um, if you care about performance, you should just block an hour and try it and see if it works. And if it works, go forward with it. Because even though PHP 7 doesn't make your IO any more efficient, it does increase your execution time of all your code by up to, you know, a lot. Right, in some cases up to 70 or 80 percent. And that's, uh, it's, it's the easiest performance optimization you ever made because it's just like swapping out a faster engine. Um, and it's, it's a, just a drop-in thing and it totally just works. Um, so here it is, you can see a little deployment marker in the middle. Um, this is a, the same uh, process to, to do a, a, an, admin, an admin screen and then edit a node and put it through a workflow before, after. Here's a live website. You know, you can tell when they deployed the update to PHP 7. Um, it's, it's just definitely a win, and uh, you'll, you won't regret it for a second. It'll be one of the easiest things you ever did to improve the performance of your website. Um, we're also working on a, a new cache architecture called LCache, which is an open source project designed to get around some of the bottlenecks we see with I.O. and caching. Um, because we built a distributed system, there's all these things that are network attached, which is great for scalability um, and flexibility, but not so great sometimes for performance. And so um, LCache takes a page from modern multi-core processor architecture and implements a L1 cache that's a very fast cache that's inside each application container, and then a common L2 cache to make sure that everything is sane and coherent and nothing gets lost. And what that does in practice is it just cuts down on the number of external calls to the database or to Redis that need to get made to render pages. In addition to that, because we're caching frequently accessed items within PHP, we don't have to do the work of turning uh, objects into, or rather taking uh, a bunch of ASCII text that we receive from the database and serializing that into a PHP object. You can just store it natively, which is you know, a nice thing not to have to redo over and over again. You keep those hottest items in that fast cache. It really allevi alleviates a lot of the bottlenecks that we've seen. Um, still in the early days with that, but we're pretty optimistic that it's going to be um, a win across most sites. And so like in our own benchmarking, we can see things like Redis with a cold cache, Redis with a warm cache, L cache with a cold cache, L cache with a warm cache. And again, being able to use our um, visibility into the data to have a shared set of facts between ourselves and our customers for support or for um, developing new capabilities for Drupal um, lets us sort of prove that it's going to work and have a lot of confidence that um, we're, we're making things better for everyone. Um, there's a lot more data I want, I'd like to gather and um, you know, by, maybe I'll do this talk again uh, at Next Bad Camp or maybe uh, DrupalCon Baltimore. Um, I'd like to have more data on Drupal 8 right now um, because New Relic is opt-in um, and I had a threshold for traffic. There were not a statistically significant number of Drupal 8 sites for me to draw um, lessons from. So in general, I can tell you that Drupal 8 is performant, um, but I can't give you the same type, like if I broke down Drupal 8 versus Drupal 7, it would be like thousands of sites versus tens of sites that met our traffic threshold. And so I wouldn't feel confident presenting a statistical observation on that. But we will gather more data as more Drupal 8 sites launch. And, uh, and I think it'll be uh, pretty exciting. Um, I want to identify other modules that might be associated with slowness um, and be able to kind of proactively scan for this. I have to work a little bit on how we're extracting data from New Relic's API to make this more efficient. But um, I think it would be great to be able to, to look across you know, the thousands of sites that we have and growing and be able to say like, hey, turns out that um, commerce sites tend to spend a lot of time in rules. And maybe that's okay because commerce sites are driven by rules, but just knowing that and being able to see exactly where and why and how could provide very useful data for us to like either do patches or improve best practices and so forth. Um, and finally, we're actually starting to work on uh, implementing the ability to gather this data into our own um, upstream update workflows and our own workflows for like LCache and everything else, but like to make this available for you know, whatever we're doing with Drupal core or contrib modules. If you want to have a performance test as part of your release process, it should be possible to do that in a way that's uh, uh, accurate and free with Pantheon and, and trying to gather um, more of this data and making it more a standard part of people's toolkit to look at this stuff and care about it before they release code. Um, so look for more on all that in the future. And with that, I've reached the end of my data and I'm happy to take anybody's questions. Yes. So the question is about um, how will Big Pipe affect this? Um, so what Big Pipe in particular does not actually affect the total page response time. Um, if it currently takes you a second and a half to generate a page, 
with BigPipe enabled, it will still take you a second and a half to generate a page. However, what BigPipe does is, um, in the words of performance engineers, improve the perceived performance of your website. And I would argue that the only performance that matters is perceived performance. So basically what happens with BigPipe is um, you can cache uh, uh, segments of the page build process of the render pipeline and you can also deliver them as soon as they're ready. So uh, what you'll get, it's, it's a really common thing on the, on the web now, like if you load Facebook or you load Twitter, like the main stuff loads and then some other stuff pops in afterwards. Um, Big Pipe allows you to just have that be a part of how you are working with Drupal 8 and it, it will work off of all of Drupal 8's native sort of individual unit caching system. So the block caching system will, will work fine with it. Um, panels caching should work fine with it so that you can basically build a kind of progressively built uh, uh, page view experience for sites that aren't able to be cached at the edge, right? So a full page cache is still gonna be better because it sends the full page back right away. But if you have to generate the page dynamically, Big Pipe allows you to send it kind of as it's being built. So the full time is still the full time, but the user starts to see stuff sooner, which pleases them more and keeps them from navigating away. Does that make sense? Other questions? Yeah. Did I miss something or did you, did you not talk about opcode caching? Um, I assumed that everyone uses opcode caching. Okay. So I, I apologize. I, um, uh, if you are not using opcode caching, there's actually a few things. I wanted to put PHP sound in this bucket, but it's because it's like kind of new and there's still some issues with it. I used to have a slide that was like, you're wasting your life if, it's like, if you're using spinning disks, you're wasting your life. Just get a machine that has solid state drives and don't think about anything else until you've done that because you're just like, you're, you're letting physics eat your time. Don't do that. Same thing with opcode cache. If you don't have opcode cache enabled for your website, then you are subjecting your website to I.O. based constraints on every page load as it has to examine all the files that are necessary to run Drupal. And opcode cache prevents that and it's one of the quickest and most awesome wins. The newer versions of PHP from 5.6 onwards just have it enabled and installed by default. And so I'm looking forward to a future where it's just, we can just safely assume that everyone's doing that now. And, and, and on Pantheon, you can't turn it off. So, right, so for, the data, for the data set, everyone's got opcode cache. All your metrics is always up. Yes, in all of our metrics, opcode cache is always enabled. Sorry, I should have stipulated that. Other questions? Uh, this is also another question about, you mentioned Reddit multiple times in terms of it being I.O. But my, my, my thought is I.O. The whole point of Reddit is that it's taking away right? <laughs> So it's, it's really, it's trading one for the other. So like if you use Redis or Memcache, they're kind of used, both of them are used frequently and they're, they're roughly equivalent for, for our intents and purposes. Um, the ultimate bottleneck for every Drupal website is the database, because that is the master data store, right? And that is the thing that you have to write to whenever you want to store data that you intend to persist in any way. And it's the thing that you read all your data from, except for that which can be cached. And so when you're, um, uh, what you're doing by using Redis or Memcache is you're saying, here's a class of I.O. operations that I can send to this other more performant and maybe more scalable uh, resource versus burdening my database, which is, my al which is already doing a whole lot of other work with that responsibility. Out of the box, Drupal by default will cache everything in the database. That means caches need to be written into the database. Writes can take some time. It can create some blocks. Reads need to come out of the database. Usually they're pretty fast. If you have a, again, if you're on SSDs and you have a modern version of MySQL, MySQL makes a pretty good key value store. But still, it's like it's in addition to all the other traffic that's going to the database. And so the reason why people implement Redis or Memcache is so they can take all the cache workload off of the database and put it over here on these other resources that can handle it a bit better and more importantly alleviate that other thing from having to deal with it. But it's still I.O. It's still an external service that you have to talk to. Um, when uh, with Lcache uh, that we're working on here, the idea is to have two layers of cache and the first layer be inside PHP itself which does mean that there's no I.O. when talking to that first layer of cache and no uh, workload to serialize or unserialize the data objects. So the 
the theory of LCash and its benefit is that we're able to get a layer of, you know, we can get 80 to 90% of all the cache requests to require no I.O., and that makes it much faster. Um, and the, the magic is that we're able to do this in a way that still works in a distributed system. Like this is, if, you, if you're just running on the one box architecture and you're comfortable with the other trade-offs you can make, you get out of a lot of these things because you can have all your stuff be local, you can use APC as your own only caching interface and just you're on one box and actually that can be very fast. The downside is that if your one box ever has an issue, your whole website has an issue and you can't scale. Like the one box is your limiting factor, you'll tip it over and then you know, you'll know you be dead in the water. Um, LCache is trying to get back some of those benefits for sites that are distributed like on a platform like ours. Yes? What's the roadmap looking like for that? Uh, the roadmap for LCache. Um, so we currently have sites in production that are using it. Um, we are actively looking at other candidate sites to use it. It's, the code is actually available for anyone who wants to run it, um, but what we've been going through, um, actually this is from a standard benchmark uh, that I've we developed um, that we've been using for, for sites. Basically we spin up a multi-dev environment, so like on Pantheon that's just a, a development environment that's connected, has all the same characteristics as the production environment and you know, lets you easily grab a copy of the code in the database and we run this uh, spider across it that basically just goes and grabs lots of pages the same way a Google bot would. Um, we do that cold and warm and then cold and warm. And this is a successful uh, LCache pass. We're still finding cases where it's not as good as Redis or where something breaks. Um, and so we're still in the, in the, the code on Drupal.org is labeled alpha and it's because we're still actively kind of finding and eliminating edge cases. Uh, but if you are interested in helping us find and eliminate edge cases, we'd love to talk about like getting something set up to be able to, to try that out. Um, and I would expect that before the end of the year, we will at least have a beta that we're very confident about, if not a 1.0 release. Any more for any more? Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your bedroom. <laughs>